Good evening, good afternoon, everybody. We're back for World War II TV. This is a sort of a solo show. It kind of concludes our attrition beyond the beachhead week. And then I've got a gap of three days. Then medics week starts on Monday. So I've got a bit of a quiet patch because I had been burning the candle at both ends, really bringing you all these shows over the D-Day period. So this is sort of a solo one. And I'm really quite excited about this one because we've not tackled this kind of show for a while. We're looking at a single unit and how it went from arriving in Normandy right up the end of the Normandy campaign in August. And it's an unusual one because it's infantry, but there's the armor connection because the 11th Armor Division had with it infantry units who were kind of mechanized. And we'll discuss what exactly that means when we get into the show. So joining me from the Netherlands, uh, Ronald Yelters, uh, who is a historian. He has a website about the 8th Battalion Rifle Brigade. The description and how to find the website is in the description below. Good evening, Ronald. How are you doing? Doing fine. Uh, thank you, Paul. Happy, happy to be here. <laughs> so, you're a Dutchman. How did you get interested in this particular unit? Was it was it the 11th Armoured Division that drew you first? Was it the Rifle Brigade? There must be a story as to why you, you discovered the unit. Yeah, there, there is a story, but not, not the original interest. I, I've been interested in, uh, in the Second World War for about my whole life, and also from quite early on in the, in the British part of it. Uh, maybe it's got to do with the operation and market guarding taking place in Holland. And since about, no, not about, since 1994, I've been uh, going to Normandy uh, at least every five years during the commemorations. And in 1999, um, yeah, I've, I've always also been looking not just at what happened to, at the beaches, but also a little bit inland. So I knew just a little bit about that. And in 1999, I met uh, an 8th Rifle Brigade veteran in Normandy. I will tell a little bit more about that uh, when, we, when we start the, uh, the presentation. But I met this veteran and then we sat down talking. Uh, it was uh, at the base of the bridge, uh, by the way. And we sat down talking and that, that was so very, very interesting. And what was also interesting was what he uh, sent me through the mail uh, a few weeks or months later. So that's what really started the, the very specific interest in the in the Eighth Rifle Brigade, and with it, of course, also in the in the Eleventh Armoured Division. Well, that's a nice, concise. And I'm I'm wondering how many historians have had opening conversations at Pegasus Bridge, because I can think of a, a lot of conversations I've had with people I met there over the years: Richard Todd, various veterans, other historians. It's like Sant Mary Glees for the American sector. Pegasus Bridge is somewhere where people like ourselves end up bumping into other people like ourselves, and you make these friendships that lead to books and history projects. And yeah. anyway. I think the, the nice week was it was not not uh, really the, the week of D-Day itself, but the week after. So it was a little bit quieter. I think it was always a little bit um, quieter than these these days. Yeah, these well, this year was nice and quiet. Yeah, yeah. But anyway. <laughs> so, so you've got you've provided us a really brilliant PowerPoint that you will talk us through. And as usual, you know, tell me when to move forward if you need me to move forward. And for those watching, if you've got any particular questions, then do then do put them in the comments there. I think, to be honest, if your questions are going to be about how this unit functions, I think that will all be answered during the show. I think for Americans watching. Uh, this is similar to kind of the mechanized reconnaissance cavalry kind of units you have, but Ronald will explain all that and exactly how this, this unit came to be and what their role was. And we've got some audio clips to play you as well during the show, which is thing from this vet, uh, veteran that, that Ronald talked about. So I'll hand over to you, Ronald. And then when I have questions I want to ask you or points to clarify, I will jump in. And when you need me to move on the slide, just say next slide. Okay, that's fine. Uh, thank you, Paul. Uh, no. It is, of course, about the 8th Rifle Brigade. Um, they landed only a week after D-Day, but of course the Battle of Normandy went on for well, two or three months after D-Day. So, um, well, they, they did take part in quite a few major bat battles in Normandy, which we'll come to later. Here we see this uh, Mr. Don Gillett, whom I met at uh, Pegasus Bridge. He was there with a with an uh, pre-war uh, rifle brigade gentleman, even um, at the time we met. And as I said, we sat down for for quite a long while um, uh, at Bagsay Bridge on the well, the, the restaurant, the, the how do you say the pub uh, over there, yeah. the famous pub. And um, well, we got along quite well. We not only talked about the war, but also about life in general. And it was, it was really nice to be uh, with him to discuss everything with him. 
And anyway, uh, we got along nice. And, and uh, I think you already told me about the tapes, but uh, a few weeks or a month later, uh, also plans to come to Holland uh, developed. We did come to Holland uh, next year. We made, made some battlefield tours there. But he sent me his tapes. He had recorded uh, his experiences between landing in Normandy in June 44 until uh, arriving in, uh, in Germany on the Baltic coast in, in May 1945. He had recorded that on, on uh, some 12 hours of tapes. And he sent me those. And I, well, always found them uh, very, very fascinating. And maybe if you go to, to the next slide. Um, now this is um, the platoon which, um, which Don was in. It was a 13 platoon H company. He's standing on the left of this photo. And um, of this platoon, there, there are a little over 40 people. But Don is one out of only three to see it through uh, all the way from, from arriving to Normandy on the 13th until, uh, until the 8th of May in Germany. And of course, quite a few of the others got wounded or, uh, or got killed. Uh, some were also transferred or some arrived a little bit later in Normandy, but he was one out of only three to, to see it through all the way. Anyway, I got these tapes and um, yeah, I think I more or less immediately figured out I had to do something with them because they were really special. In the end, it has taken me 20 years to, to get the book done, which you can see on the right. It's only got published in uh, 2019, so two years ago. Uh, in the meantime, sadly, Donat had passed away. He passed away in 2009. But I did meet his, uh, his sons uh, in England and also in Normandy uh, in 2019 and earlier on in England. And what I found also was quite spectacular. I found his uh, commanding officer of his, uh, of his platoon. Uh, it was Lieutenant Brian Neal. At the time when I met him, he was uh, Sir Brian Neal. And I've seen him twice, which was, was really great in London in, in 2015 and 2017. And he was also kind enough to, to do some proofreading of the book and write the foreword uh, to it. So that, that was uh, well, really nice uh, while preparing the book. And anyway, when preparing it, I'd, I'd uh, collected so much material. I um, was looking for photos and maps and everything else that um, in the end, I had so much material that I decided to, to build the website and then later on this Facebook page, but just to get, well, just to collect as much information as I can get. And I still get written quite regularly by, uh, well, most of the time, of course, relatives from, from veterans. And this is one of the revolutions we've had with social media and the internet is there are many people like yourself. Frederick Jean is watching tonight in France, who's done incredible work about Canadian units. Good evening, Frederick. And you know, we have your, your tier one of historians, your Peter Caddick Adams and your John McManuses and James Holland who look at operational levels and campaigns. And then below that, but not necessarily below in terms of importance, you have people like yourself and Frederick and all these other historians around the world who, who focus in on one unit or one regiment or one battalion or one particular campaign or one particular mm -hmm. town. And it's from these people that actually you get a lot of real detail. And uh, that's why these shows are really important because um, it's that, that expertise in one area that is so right. really cool. Yeah, I think one of the things which is pretty unique to the 8th Rifle Brigade is that all the names of the wartime members are known. So it's also yeah. quite easy for family when looking looking up to find uh, to find our relatives so that that really helps uh, to get additional material so you know anyway. you said yourself in the in the top of the show then i said there you know this is part of kind of the attrition and break uh, and 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 beyond the beach aspect and the eighth battalion were there in every single major camp campaign in normandy and you know we're always talking on world war ii tv that there's so much happened beyond the beach you know that yes. And this unit was there. They were Epsom, as we'll find out, and Blue Coat and, and, and Valet's Gap and all the way through. And so uh, I'll hand back to you again to explain how we're going to structure this and what we're going to do. And it'll be, it'll be really cool. Well, that, that's true, Paul, apart from D-Day, of course, because they landed a week later. But they've, they've been in, um, well, most of the major, major British operations. Uh, no, the first one, uh, end of June, was Operation Epsom. And then if you click once more, I've, I've indicated them all. Uh, Epsom, of course, just to the to the west of Caen. Uh, Goodwood, just to the east of Caen, again uh, a few weeks later, mid uh, mid July. Uh, then there was a well, tiny break again. I will go into that later. 
but uh, then they took part in Operation Blue Coat, uh, about 30 kilometers south of Bayeux, yeah, between uh, Comont and Vier. And then they had a, well, a slightly less prominent part in uh, the battle for the Falaise pocket. And when I'm saying slightly less prominent, that, that's of course in comparison to these earlier operations and to what went on in the center of the, of the Falaise pocket. Uh, also that, also there, there was well, considerable fighting going on. And then, uh, well, just a little later, about a week later, they, they arrived at the Seine. Uh, the Seine bridges itself were taken by, by another division, I believe by the 43rd Wessex. But a week later, end of August, they finally well, more or less left Normandy when, when crossing the Seine at, uh, at Fernand. So this and roughly the area. Well, you can come back in, in September, October, and we can do the Netherlands <laughs> phase as well. If if this gets great views and people say, you must bring Ronald back, we can do the next <laughs> campaign. But it's normally tonight, folks. I've got a slight teaser at the end for you, Paul. <laughs> okay, good. Now, um, well, before we go to these battles, uh, here's a little bit about the, the organization. Uh, the 8th, 8th Battalion was, of course, part of the 11th Armored uh, Division. Uh, about well, 15,000 men, so, so a huge organization, of course, a division. I believe 350 tanks and, well, easily a couple of thousand uh, vehicles. And this one was commanded by a um, 37 year old um, General Pip Roberts. And he was uh, the youngest general in the British Army. Um, as part of the division, there were two brigades infantry, infantry brigade and the 29th Armored Brigade, commanded by Roscoe Harvey. Also a nickname, name, by the way. And Roscoe Harvey and Pip Roberts had in common that they had a distinguished service order with uh, with two bars. And that, well, looking at it like this, it, that seems uh, relatively common, but that certainly wasn't. I, I had to look it up, but there, there were only well, a little over 50 people during the whole war. So that's it. Army, uh, Navy and Air Force uh, who got two bars with our distinguished, distinguished mm -hmm. service order. So that's that says a little bit about uh, about their career during the war. And they also both uh, served and got to know each other in North Africa. And then the, the H, no, if you, sorry, if you go back one, right, the Eighth Battalion yeah. itself uh, was commanded since 1942 by uh, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Trenier Michel, but he was replaced shor shortly after Epsom by Tony Hunter, and he was only 29 years old and also uh, a desert veteran. Okay, if we yeah, go to the next one. Up. Yep. Yep. You can you can click you can click one more. Of, maybe I've built in a few too many clicks, but yep. never mind. Uh, no, this uh, 29th Armored Brigade. Uh, it had uh, three tank regiments. Uh, well, they're as shown here: 23rd Hussars and 3rd Royal Tank Regiment, and 2nd, 5th, and 4th for Yeomanry. Uh, normally, they were all equipped with uh, Sherman tanks. And most of them um, with 75 millimeter guns, though, which were not of much use against uh, the German armor, but, but of course pretty useful against infantry and, and uh, anti-tank uh, weapons or machine guns. And uh, uh, well, some of the Shermans were equipped with uh, the, the top right picture with the uh, 17 pounder guns, yeah. which, which really could take on the German tanks. But uh, those were only one in four of the uh, of the tanks later there became available a little bit more um, and the, the, the fourth picture if you click once more uh, Paul uh, that's of course uh, the fourth battalion in the 29th armored brigade with the 8th rifle brigade and that was a, a so-called uh, motor battalion I will, in a moment I will show a little bit more about what what they were doing um, Yes, well, the, the battalion itself, um, a little over 850 people, 38 officers. I said uh, Lieutenant, Colonel, Colonel, mm. Lieutenant Colonel Hunter was quite young, 29. But many of the platoon commanders, the lieutenants, uh, quite a few of them were only 19 years old. And um, Lieutenant New, we saw earlier, he was 20 years old when taking his troops into battle and on the hill 112 for the first time so well, i think that's quite uh, quite something for uh, someone at that age but it, i think it was pretty normal for um, infantry uh, junior officers and um, 
yes, to the battalion had uh, three motor companies and, uh, and a support company. And if we go to the next slide, I can tell you a little bit more about their equipment. Now, the motor companies had a scout platoon, I like the one from, from Don Gillett, uh, the group you saw in the first, first photo. Uh, scout company equipped with uh, brand carriers. Like they were really fast moving, uh, uh, lightly armored vehicles, open topped. Uh, 11 per scout company. Uh, well, scout reconnaissance, uh, they had a reconnaissance role, of course. And three motor platoons in each, each company uh, who were traveling in uh, these American half tracks um, vehicles. Uh, one section per Per half track, so for um, there were four half tracks per platoon, and there was also a mortar section attached, attached to each of the um, of the motor companies. And the uh, top right, you see a Sergeant Froon from F Company at his typewriter. So on some other shows, you can zoom in, uh, Paul, at work at his typewriter, but you can see the the three inch mortar staying at the back. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. Now, so that's the, um, the motor companies, and then you also had E Company, the support company. They were equipped with uh, six pounder anti tank guns and uh, medium machine gun carriers. And they were usually not fighting as one, one unit, but always uh, divided and attached to the other uh, companies. So, um, yeah, that's the support role. Uh, the final sheet about the uh, the organization and the role of the, of the motor battalion. Uh, there are, of course, very flexible infantry to, 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 to keep up with the, um, with the armored regiments, with the tanks. They also had a role to protect uh, the tanks and the tanks to, to protect the infantry. Of course, the tanks, they don't like uh, some German creeping up to a tank with a Panzerfaust. Eh? You can't see very much inside the tank. So that, that's a realistic risk, um, especially with more fanatical troops. So they had to protect the tanks and uh, also of course it's this uh, reconnaissance rule that goes for the whole um for the whole battalion uh, excuse me for the whole brigade they had this uh, reconnaissance rule especially the um the scout platoons of course and i think it's interesting i just to jump in that there's a couple of americans canadians watching i think a lot of people have, have kind of forgotten over the years that the important role of the motorized battalions within an armored division, they think of an armored division as simply being tanks. Um, and, and this kind of role gets, gets overlooked a little bit. And even some of the books that talk about armored warfare in generally, um, you know, magnificent books by people like John Buckley, they, they don't go into much detail about this element of the divisions because only so much you can put in books. So I think it's interesting that we are going to be discussing this role tonight because I think it is, of many things that are overlooked in Normandy campaign, I think motorized infantry is one of the ones that is really overlooked. Yeah, I forgot to tell it at the, at the beginning, but the, the 11th Armored Division, they had not fought before Normandy. So they had been training um, for about four or five years because they, they were raised in 1941. And yeah, I think on the one hand, uh, also this inexperience may have been an advantage because uh, they, were, they were really ready and well-trained and not yet suffering from battle fatigue, eh? like, like some other units who had fought in, in North Africa and Italy and everywhere. And also that they had, they were really the division who was best in in this this um, how do you put it this mutual role of the of the infantry yeah I, I, they, and they're the, the most up to date aren't they I mean we we yes. could argue that Seventh Armored Division had the most experience out in North Africa sure sure, but they were they were fighting the war on earlier war technology whereas Eleventh Armored Division when I think about it, they are fighting with the latest stuff the latest this this very training manual that you're showing now yeah. this is the latest stuff of the War Office and people have are writing about how to use armored divisions. So to me, the Eleventh Armored have that have that um, role. They're kind of leading the way in the latest technology. Not not technology in terms of vehicles, but technology in terms of of how to use them. Yes, that's that's true. Okay. Um, so um, although I did say uh, they didn't land on D-Day, I would like to start uh, on D-Day. And if you go to the next slide, uh, Paul. Now, funnily enough, um, the battalion had a sports day on D-Day. This had, of course, been planned a little beforehand. 
the division already knew that they would, would not be involved in D-Day itself. They would only land, uh, not maybe a few weeks, or sorry, a few days later. And the troops, of course, they had to be kept busy. So this sports day was planned, and well, despite the news in the morning on, on the radio and in the, in the newspapers, of course, and then, well, I believe literally thousands of vehicles, of, of, uh, <laughs> of airplanes flying overhead, uh, some of them with flyers and bombers and, and uh, well, et cetera. Uh, this sports day went ahead as if, if nothing happened and was nicely finished and done and um, well, completely carried through. But still, at the end of the day, um, or in fact, two days later, the battalion moved from Aldershot to, to an area near, near Tilbury Harbour in London at the Thames. And um, I believe on the ninth, uh, loading of vehicles on, on two ships uh, started. All the vehicle and men, they went on board on two, two Liberty ships, like the one shown on, uh, on this picture. And I believe um, yeah, this one very nicely has, got, has even got landing craft hanging on the sides. But yeah, great photo. Yeah, that, that may not have been the case for the 8th Rifle Brigade. But anyway, I believe on the, on the 10th, they, um, they left port. Then they had to wait uh, uh, at sea for a few days, probably for the rest of the convoy joining up. Uh, one of the Liberty ships had, had probably been transporting meat uh, beforehand. So it was really an awful smell in the... Um, how do you say in the area and hold, the, and hold, yeah. the, hold, the troops slept on hammocks, uh, awful smell and a few, a few rats were found. But anyway, on the 12th, they sailed off um, for Normandy, as we can see here on an uneventful voyage. And on the 13th, um, they arrived in Normandy, offshore, of course, uh, anchoring offshore about, well, let's say a few, uh, a few kilometers offshore. Uh, in the early morning, uh, by about midday, um, um, the vehicles um, were hauled, uh, how do you say, overboard on, on these tank landing craft. Yep. And the men climbed down on, on these rope uh, ladders. And a little after three o'clock, the first man uh, stepped on shore uh, near Grey sur Mer, a little bit east, or sorry, a little bit west of uh, Courseux. Um, well, very near the, the, the beach exit uh, indicated by this, uh, the arrow on this uh, aerial photograph. That's where my brother-in-law lives, right? That My, my okay. brother-in-law lives in Grey Samaire there, so he, 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 he did, wasn't there at the time, but that's right where he is, so uh, well, I know the area very well. Great, great place to live. I think it's also the area where, where the goal uh, That's it, yeah, Normandy. the goal was there yeah. 77 years ago, two days ago it was, yeah, three days ago, yeah. Okay. No, but um, as you said, Paul, I've put in a few uh, uh, audio uh, fragments. They're all from the well, the tapes I showed earlier from Don Gillett. And I think it's to give some idea of what, it, what it's been like to, to arrive there uh, on this ship. I think that the tape starts. Yeah. Um, yeah. After trying to get a night's sleep uh, on the night from the 12th okay. to the 13th. So let, let's just do now. that. Uh, But of course that wasn't so easy, and I don't suppose many of us slept very much more for the rest of that night. But the following morning at dawn, we appear to have thrown out the anchor, and uh, we were roused, and we all got out of our hammocks and stretched ourselves, and made our way up onto the deck. And in the cold light of dawn, there indeed it all was, Normandy the Normandy beaches. And the beaches and the surrounding sea were a sight I shall never forget for the rest of my life. It's as clear to me today as it was on that 13th of June, all that time ago. And my old friends, whom I see occasionally, they have an exactly parallel experience. It's all quite clear for them. We were standing about three miles off the shore near a village that we later discovered was called Grey sur Mer. And out at sea, the sea was absolutely black with ships. There were ships as far as you could see to every horizon. There seemed to be one every 100 or 200 yards packed together. It must have made a marvelous target for the Luftwaffe, if only they'd been able to get at us. 
but the Navy had thought of that too. Their air defenses were extremely good, and every ship, almost every ship, had a barrage balloon on it. Nor should we forget that somewhere behind the scenes, the RAF were keeping the Luftwaffe away. But for us, by far the most impressive of all the ships we could see were the battleships Rodney and Warspite, which stood about half a mile off us and were pumping shells 25 miles inland all day. Incidentally, the firing of a naval gun is a most impressive sight, especially when you're only half a mile from it. But, of course, you'd be even more impressed if you were on the business end uh, when it landed. And that's a great account, Ronald. I mean, it's it's it describes everything that's happening at that time of the war. The the barrage balloons, the fact that the navy is still involved, even though the campaign has moved in land. Really good stuff. Yeah, he really had a great eye for for detail, I believe. So it's it's uh, it's a really great story he's, he's telling, and he's he's been there. So it's uh, a great combination. Um. No, on this map, um, so after landing at Greiser Mare, on this map you probably see the exact route they took um, on the 13th of June, the first towards uh, Curly. Uh, there were orders um, being given or put on paper about the use of, of each and every road. They're, of course, pretty narrow roads in some, uh, uh, some of these parts of Normandy. So each road was indicated many uh, uh, one way, uh, for one-way traffic. So looking at those maps, this is probably the exact route they've taken from uh, Greiser Mare to Coley. And then, then if you go to the next uh, one, um, and by the end of the day, they arrived at uh, Coley. Coley. I'm not sure how to pronounce it in French, but... Coley, I think, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But the French will argue about how to pronounce it anyway. Yeah, it's a, but yeah. yeah. I'll probably do it wrong anyway, but they will... Yeah, I live here, we get it wrong all the time, and I wouldn't expect otherwise, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, but uh, there, there, were, there they were for, for the next uh, 10 days and not only in, of course, deproofing this water, did these vehicles, because uh, they had to go through the sea uh, when landing and also preparing for battle, but also in, in, in training and then joining up again with these uh, tank regiments, armored regiments, uh, doing exercise and also paying a visit to, to Coulon, where, they, um, where there was a German, well, German strong point or a German radar, radar station. I still would like to know what it was exactly. But the funny thing that that has not that story has not only story has not only been told by by Don Gellert, but also by uh, Rafferman Igor Igor Khrushchev. He was also from H Company. And the funny thing is, uh, Don uh, is telling us that um, they are finding dozens and dozens of bottles of fishy water. He's even describing the, the the commanding officer as some sort of uh, non-alcoholic crank. He's calling him. And somehow here, Khrushchev, in his account, uh, says the, the uh, officers' quarters were found full of uh, wine bottles, all of them being empty. So I, I guess that that will be that will remain a bit of a riddle, probably forever. Uh, whatever uh, was found there. But anyway, I'm going to that... lean on the fact it was the it was alcohol. But uh, that's, that would be my <laughs> hunch. My yeah. hunch would be if I had to put money on it, it was alcohol. Yeah, so it could guess, have been cider. Could have been cider. I guess we'll never know. No. Yeah, and they, of, of course, they also got their first acquaintance with uh, Calvados, which is also described quite a few times uh, on the tapes. Yeah. Okay, but uh, anyway, after about uh, 10 days on the 25th, they, they, um, they finally received orders for Operation Epsom, the first uh, big operation they were to be involved in. Um, now, as I said it to Paul before this, I don't, don't want to go into the, the, the whole uh, battle itself too much, but I thought it's nice to, to show this um, uh, this graph at least. But this shows the extent uh, of the advance during Operation Epsom by 8th Corps. Originally, the, the advance uh, should have been much further, also across the River Orne, uh, which you can see um, at the bottom of the uh, of the picture. And you can also see a little bit why the operation eventually was called off. Yeah, there was a serious risk developing of uh, the 11th Armored Division being cut off by, uh, by the German Panzer Divisions. And well, if you look at this picture, you can also see very nicely that they were opposed by uh, no less than six 
uh, German Panzer divisions. So it was not, uh, let's say it was not, not an imaginary risk, uh, I suppose. Uh, yeah, although I haven't researched this in, in, in any detail, but um, there was some serious uh, armored opposition encounter exactly. here. Um, yes, if you go to the next slide. Cool. Now, so on the 25th, I received orders. Uh, well, not much beforehand, because next morning they had to move from uh, Cully to, to show you about, um, uh, I think, 13 kilometers, I believe. Uh, and they began to see uh, all the destruction, of course, a lot more than, than in the area of, uh, of Cully and, uh, and Cully. I think here it's also good to mention that, that uh, I think the destruction is well known. But um, yeah, the Normandy campaign, of course, not only caused uh, lots of military casualties, but also I believe some, something like 15,000 French or 20,000 French were killed during the campaign for Normandy. And that, that's a, a number which is uh, very similar, I believe, to the, to the number of British uh, fatal casualties. It is. I mean, it's, it's still, it, there's still disagreements about exactly how many French were killed. It's the, the, yeah, the so. high end is up to 30,000. The accepted mm -hmm. figure is about 22,000. I was in Shu uh, last week, actually. And it's it, these days, it's one of those villages that's been completely redone. There's almost, yeah. it's almost modern houses everywhere. There's a nice little sh shopping kind of arcade, but there's a fountain there, nice. And, and then you go around the back and you see the damage to the church and the monuments that are behind the modern town hall. But it's, you get that in Normandy. For those who are watching who haven't been to Normandy, you have some towns like where I live, by uh, medieval buildings, cathedral, timber-fronted buildings, and you go to other villages like Chur or Villa Bocage or one sur odon where the complete village was destroyed and there's nothing left now from the war. So Chur is one of those ones that, yeah, pretty much wiped off the, yeah. off the face of the map. Now, if you do, do one more click, uh, it was also a show that... Um... Uh, F Company had its uh, first uh, battle, or in fact, the whole battalion had its first battle. Uh, they, they were, well, helping uh, helping out uh, some tanks of second five and four for yeomanry, you know, one of the the armored regiments. And while doing so, um, was it against one of the SS uh, Panzer divisions, 12th, I believe. And while doing so, one of the half tracks got hit by an by an 88 millimeter shell, uh, and all the occupants, uh, 10 of them, uh, got killed and three got seriously wounded, one of them being uh, Edward Russell, you see here at the top. And um, yeah, he was found by his brother, Jack Russell, who was in the same, um, well, at least in F Company, I'm not sure if he was in the same, uh, same platoon. But he was found and brought to safety by his brother, Jack Russell. And well, luckily, uh, Edward Russell also survived the war. I'm, I'm in touch with his son uh, also. But um, it took him 18 months to, to recover, and he kept a serious limp for the rest of, the li of his life. So um, and that was also the biggest well, loss through one single hit for F Company. So it was, was really unlucky, that, uh, mm. that event. Um, anyway, next, the next day and next slide, uh, the advance continued. Uh, up to then, a rifle brigade was more or less following on behind the um, uh, 15th Division, Scottish Division. Uh, but then they, they were nearing the River Odon. Um, H Company got its first vehicle casualty. Uh, both occupants, they, they survived. One of them, uh, Rifleman Rodkoff, you see here. But unfortunately, he, he got killed next day on top of Hill 112. Um, anyway, um, I think by... I believe by, by the end of the of midday, uh, the bridge over the river Odon near Tourmaville had been taken by the 15th Scottish Division. And about an hour uh, later, um, uh, 23rd Hussars and 8th Rifle Brigade, they took over the lead, crossed the river, and advanced uh, to Baron, about uh, two kilometers from Hill 112, which uh, they cleared and took and held for, for the rest of the night. Um, yes, and I say the rest for the night, so they had some sleep, but of course with the, the uh, expectations of the battle for the next day, and of course getting up uh, at daylight, so, so about uh, four o'clock in the morning, or maybe even a bit earlier, so they, they didn't sleep very much, uh, these troops, during an operation. 
Um, so here we are at Baron on the 27th, and the next day on the 28th, the advance continues to Hill 112. Uh, if you uh, you don't, don't really need to zoom in there. There's an, um, I'm zooming in a little bit, I believe, on the next slide. So if you yep. go to that one um, on the right, uh, I don't know if it's really visible, but on the right, you see Hill 112, the more of a more or less diamond shaped wood. Uh, Hill 112 is, of course, uh, the height in meters of this point. At the time, it was also called Point 112, not, not yet Hill 112. Uh, you see Baron in the, in the middle and uh, Tourmaville and then the river that had to be crossed uh, a little bit to the left of Baron. Um, and if we then go to the, to the next slide, you will have a view of the, this is a sketch from the Battalion War Diary. And you again see the well, more or less diamond shade wood, at Hill 112. And you see this uh, rectangular field at the, at the top. There's also a written field in it. Uh, it's very nice to know that these, this field and this wood, they still exist uh, today. Uh, the field with this line of blockage around it. And also the Calvary is still there. There's a cross you see in the middle. But anyway, um, during the battle, um, at least H Company and sometimes also uh, part of G Company was on top of Hill 112 in the wood. Uh, surrounded on three sides by these uh, German tanks. And not all of them, I think, but a large part of these six uh, tank divisions. Uh, and the tanks of the 29th Armored Brigade, they were, they were a little to the north of the wood, a little bit of a, well, let's say, a hold down position. Probably less exposed to the German armor, uh, because uh, on top of the hill, they would have made too much of a target and probably come to that uh, later on during Blue Coat. But they were a little bit to the back of the hill, so the, the rifle brigade was really well, pretty much alone on top, uh, some three inch mortars, some of the six pounder anti-tank guns, but pretty much on their own. And on the, the next slide, I've, well, it's slightly longer, I hope, it's, I hope it's not too long, but I put in a, a fragment of Don Gillett again. No, it's all important stuff, this one. And, uh, you know, I did a little, uh, I was in that, that area, Oh, I can't remember where it was now. I did a tweet. I did a bit of video from that because it's that that concave slope that goes up to Hill One One Two from that area there. And it's you've only got to go there now if you know anything about battles and you see that ground there. It's it's one of those sites that or those locations that standing there is a real explains to you why it was so, such a such a tough ordeal. But we'll we'll play the clip. Now, when the pressure got too hot, as inevitably it would in the face of these Diker tanks, we had to withdraw through the wood and back to the line of the hedge and ditch where we'd left our three carriers. Unfortunately, there was a bit of open ground between the wood and the line of the hedge and the ditch, and sure enough, we had to run the gauntlet of Tiger tank shell and machine gun fire from hole to hole over that open ground, and it was all very airy. But when we got there, we found that Norman Reed section, Sergeant Norman Reed, a very pleasant fellow whom I preferred before, were reinforcing us, and they were on the line of the hedge and the ditch. Unfortunately, however, they had no idea what we'd just been up to, and when we urged them to get down into the ditch, they thought we were joking. They seemed to think that it was still some kind of exercise. Norman Reed had a lovely smile all over his face, as if we were on a day out uh, in the woods behind Brighton. Well, the German tanks didn't take this view. They'd been pooping at us all the way across that open ground, and we tried to get them to take cover and get down into the ditch because they were in fact kneeling up in the line of the hedge and everybody knows that hedges are covered from view but they're not covered from far so they're rather inclined to laugh at us for getting down into the ditch they really couldn't believe that we'd been chased by a tiger tank but I'm rather afraid that this was the last laugh that some of them ever had because the first thing that happened was that a tiger tank shell came and hit my carrier, which immediately started to burn furiously. 
and immediately on top of that, there was a shell dropped straight among the whole lot of them, and about five of them were killed instantly, including the unfortunate Norman Reed. Another of the killed was Bert Denny, who drove our carrier, the one that was burning. He hadn't been in it at the time, but he too had been sitting up in the line of that hedge in a rather exposed position. He had a brother, Len Denny, who was in another part of the platoon, and later I had to tell Len that his brother had been killed. But quite close to me was Rifleman Kirkland. He'd been very seriously wounded. Although he was wearing a kind of anorak over the top of his battle dress jacket, blood had soaked right through his back, right through this covering. And he was lying there moaning, but quite immobile, a very pitiful sight. But the day's unpleasantness was not yet over. We got back to the rest of the company and there was another extremely grisly sight. We suffered about 12 deaths altogether in the company that afternoon, and they were laid out in a line, friends that we had known for months and months together, and the dust was already beginning to settle on their faces, and they looked horrible. It seems a strange thing to talk about the weather, but it was an extremely fine day, very hot day. And together with all the horror that we'd so far seen and in the presence of all these unfortunate men who died, the mouth dried up and we yearned to drink. We hadn't, of course, eaten anything, but then we didn't have any appetite. But I could have drunk a bucket of water at that particular time. I had a pull at a water bottle, but somehow you had the feeling of guilt. You could drink. Those men were dead. It seemed as if you were taking an unfair advantage. But when you surveyed the dead and the dying, you didn't have to be a very good mathematician to say to yourself, my goodness, if we go on at this rate, I wonder how many will be in the tea on Tuesday next. So that's was the introduction to battle for the uh, for the Earth Rifle Brigade. Well, I, I'm noticing one comment about uh, it sounds almost professional, but yes, he did put a, a great amount in, of work and preparation into to making these tapes. And shortly after the war, he also worked for um, what was it? I don't know the exact name, but it was the, the, the let's say the Army Broadcasting Operation or something uh, okay. in Hamburg in Germany. So yes, he had some experience with the sound and recording and everything. He's got a very, what I would call 50, 1940s or 50s BBC voice. That's, <laughs> that's how the news readers sounded when I was a kid. They don't yeah, well, sound I don't know like if, he, if he was a news reader, but he was an announcer for the, uh, I believe the Army Broadcasting Corporation or something. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so that was the introduction into battle and also more or less the end of the battle because um, if you go to the next slide, as I said before, the the, um, the division was withdrawn back across the, the Odal. Uh, the British Army itself, of course, stayed east of the Odal, luckily. But Hill 112 was abandoned. It took until early August before Hill 112 was finally taken. Uh, it, it, it cost not only much time, but, uh, well, literally thousands of, of, of British uh, casualties to take the hill. It, it was simply too exposed to the top of the hill to be taken by by any side in fact because also the germans they didn't take or retake hill 112 after this um, this event uh, but it, it, it had, i think that the depressing thing about the drive back you you read on the on the top quote i think that that mainly had to do because the morale was still quite high uh, also on top of the hill but that mainly had to do with, with all these uh, casualties, all the sacrifice, and then pulling back. That, of course, was really depressing to, uh, to the troops. Um, otherwise, I think that, that they were in a relatively good shape and form. Okay, and then there's, well, a sort of a break. One week, uh, I believe, was a real break. The second week was um, in some sort of counterattack role 
uh, which which wasn't made use of next to uh, to some sort of artillery regiment, so not, not really quite a uh, place to be. Uh, of course, reinforcements were needed because about 20% of the, of the um, battalion um, uh, got, got casualty during uh, Operation Epsom, so lots of reinforcements were needed. And then on the 17th, um, mid-July, orders for Operation Epsom uh, arrived, starting again next day. Or sorry, for Operation Goodwood, Goodwood. I mean. Yeah. Yes. Uh, again, a very, very big operation. I think it's the largest uh, tank battle the British Army ever had. Here it says 700 tanks, but there were three armored divisions. I think there were more, slightly over a thousand tanks. Uh, preliminary, preliminary bombardment by uh, 3,000 aeroplanes, uh, lots of artillery against uh, a weak enemy, it was uh, thought, but well, didn't, didn't turn on didn't turn out uh, that way. Um, yeah, and prior to the battle, the first bottle of beer, so that will have helped. And the crater of Blanco understood from uh, Don. Oh, Blanco. yeah. If, yeah. In, if in doubt, there's a gap. <laughs> Blanco, that equipment again. And if any Americans are wondering who don't know what, when we said Blanco, the British web gear <laughs> that they all wore, the webbing equipment could was came in a kind of a neutral khaki color but that you, you had to put a kind of a, a protective paste on it made of this blanco stuff and water that, that both waterproofed it supposing and turned it changed changed its color to either a dark green or mid green and so it's one of those standard jobs you give people in the british army if they've got nothing to do is polish your boots brass your polish your brasses and blanco your webbing and then unblanco your and then blanco it again there was always new colors coming through and new camouflage schemes but yeah every british soldier remembers blancoing their gear carried on up till about the 1970s i guess anyway I digress. Yes, no, that's that's fine. So, Operation uh, Goodwood. And Operation I think the, Goodwood. The only thing I was going to say to jump in, when you're tackling things like Operation Goodwood, sometimes the only way to look at it is from the point of view of one one unit, because otherwise you're you're going you're following regiment after regiment, and and it can be very very difficult following at an operational level to get any kind of sense of what it was like for individuals. But following it from a individual unit point of view is 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 really informative yes <laughs> thank you now <clears throat> operation goodwood uh, again uh, well an operation on a huge uh, scale again with the aim of um, uh, getting somewhere to the south of uh, Caen, uh, this time uh, around the east side of Caen. and uh, well the operation wasn't uh, a complete success in the sense that that they didn't manage to arrive the the ultimate goal but i want to come back a little bit to that uh, in, in a tiny moment and one of the reasons why it wasn't a complete success is because all these three tank divisions had to cross the the Orne river and the Khan uh, canal uh, the night before the operation because otherwise of course all this dust from all these thousands of vehicles and tanks that would give the show away immediately so they had to cross during the night in the few hours of darkness and quite a lot of uh, units simply arrived too late. Um, I was also talking about uh, the success of the operation or, or the failure, whatever you want to call it. And I, I think uh, Epsom and Goodwood, they often have been called a, a failure because these ultimate uh, um, objects or locations were not, not, uh, not taken. But well, the fact is, and the, I heard it being mentioned in the show um, last week or the week before, Paul. But the fact is that, that virtually or literally all the German armor was up against the British and Canadian units, of course, uh, here around Caen. Uh, and not only a lot of British tanks were destroyed, about 400 were destroyed, 400 British tanks in, in Goodwood alone, but also loads and loads of German tanks and equipment and vehicles. And yeah, for the Allies, uh, there was sort of limitless supply of vehicles and tanks and everything. So it was really easy yeah. to replace at least the vehicles. Well, I think James Holland makes that point in his book, Normandy 44, I think, of the 400 tanks the British lost. I think they uh, half the crews went up, went, walked back and picked up a new one and right. a new tank the next day. All the other tanks were lost. Some of them are patched up and repaired again, whereas all the ones the Germans lost were lost they were absolutely lost and the other thing i want to point i want to make is when you're looking at these operations 
Epsom, Goodwood, Bluecoat, and even Cobra and beyond, is they bear studying as a complete set. If you look at them individually, Epsom doesn't seem to achieve very much. Perhaps if you look at Goodwood, it doesn't seem to achieve very much. But when you put it in the in the league, the league, the, the season of fixtures, if you like, if we use a football analogy, over the course of those fixtures, there is progression being made. The German army is suffering uh, losses it can't it can't re, uh, re, repair from. So when you do finally get success, the successful, the completely successful operations like Cobra, like Totalize and Tractable, you have to look at the ground, the 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 Germans that were defeated in these earlier operations that maybe weren't completely victorious, but they were part of that big campaign. But we're going down a rabbit hole of assessing these operations in detail, which we will do in future shows. But I'll I'll hand it back to you to get back to the uh, 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 Rifle Brigade's role. No, but I do agree. I feel Epsom and, and uh, Goodwood, they've made possible the eventual breakout uh, with Cobra and, uh, yeah. and Blue Coat uh, end of July, early August. So I think they were essential and quite successful, but I well, find it painful for the, especially the veterans, of course, most of them are now gone, but we've always been, been having this sense that the, the operations were not successful. I hope and I believe they felt differently themselves. That's a very good point, yeah. yeah. Anyway, um, when crossing um, the Khan and Orn, uh, or the, what, the Khan Canal and the Orn River, uh, around Pegasus Bridge, that is. Uh, the 11th Armored, of course, arrived at the, the, the area where the airborne troops had landed and the gliders had landed. So that's quite easy to hide a, a brain carrier or, or a half track under these wings of the gliders. They were also used for that purpose in the morning of the 18th. And uh, in the beginning, everything went well. Uh, German troops were completely stunned by, by this bombardment. Uh, tanks uh, advanced rapidly. And the, the um, eight rifle brigade played their role with uh, well, rounding up the tiny pockets of, of remaining resistance, sending back prisoners to the rear, etc. So everything went well. But uh, somewhere later in the day, uh, they noticed uh, lots and lots of tanks uh, being destroyed by the Germans. So things uh, worked out differently than uh, had been expected beforehand. Anyway, at the um, end of the 18th, uh, G Company was somewhere near Hubert Folly. Uh, H and F Company were near Grandville. And that Grandville, um, I think it's nice to mention, uh, Stan Triggs, Sergeant Stan Triggs, won one of the little over 30 gallantry medals of the battalion. Uh, his carrier was shot up. He brought his driver to safety, then took over another brain carrier. And with it, uh, on the 18th, he captured uh, an important gun at uh, Grandville, intact. And he did the same trick again uh, at Bra the next day. Uh, they're capturing a gun which had taken out a few tanks uh, beforehand. Uh, again intact, I believe complete with crew. So he was uh, awarded the, the military medal for that. Um, and then on the, um, the following, following day, on the 19th, uh, Bra and Hubert fully were taken. Bra by uh, F Company, supported by H Company, and Hubert fully by E and um, uh, sorry by G and E Company. And and well, especially the fighting for Bra must have been um, uh, really terrific. There was a German uh, Panzergrenadier battalion there uh, um, at Bra, very well dug in. But they were completely, apparently completely overwhelmed by the, the ferocity of the attack of, um, of F Company and the part also H Company. And about 600 prisoners were, were taken and also about 600 Germans were killed, at least to the, according to the company diary. Wow. So enormous numbers against relatively little cost for, um, for the 8th Rifle Brigade. So for that... Uh, the officer commanding F Company was awarded the Military Cross also, and also uh, yeah, two other decorations went to, uh, to two other people of F Company. Uh, yeah, I'm Bra, I've, well, I've last been in, in Bra in, um, in 2014. Uh, if you look on the map, it's, it's about to be swallowed up by a car, I'm, I'm afraid. 
Yeah, still- I think by the time you come back, you'll find it's that. Uh, yeah, I was just going to make that point that this battlefield now, if you want to come and visit it, folks, now is the the, the time to do well, not now, now, wait till you got your, your vaccine, but the next few years, because Caen is being, it's a very successful city and it's gradually encroaching in the Epsom and Goodwood battlefields and even guidebooks written 10 years ago that say, as you drive this road, you'll see this isolated farmhouse. You look for it, and it's now been swallowed up by housing. And I'm not mm-hmm. saying that in a negative way, in the sense that I love to see the country I now live in prospering, and I love to see the fact that Con is, is a successful town. But at the same time, visiting these battlefields is going to get a little bit more tricky over the, over the next few years. Well, I'm proud. I took this uh, photograph of, of the battle dome. It's still visible at this wall of the farmhouse. Yeah, lots of bang. Can still still see a few remains here and there, but it, it, well, the feeling of the place was still uh, very nice back then. Um, there are quite a few accounts, more than just from from Don Gillett. I mentioned Rifleman Khrushchev uh, earlier. There's also one from uh, Roland Jefferson, also privately published. He was in any e company and took part in the taking of Hubert Folie. And I thought maybe it's nice to, to read a little bit of his uh, uh, booklet, uh, Soldiering at the Sharp End. Uh, and it, it reads like this. He was 19 years old at the time. It was there that I used my sword. Uh, well, regimental traditions, of course. So in, in uh, the rifle brigade, I suppose rifle battalions, but the bayonet was called a sword. Anyway, I used my sword for the first and only time. We found ourselves at the rear of some houses and our section was checking and clearing them. As I moved along a wall, I had almost reached the end, when a German, taller and thicker than I, was backing slowly around the corner towards me. I was no more than four feet away from him, and I lunged forward, and the sword went right into his back, just above the belt. I could not have used enough force, because only about three inches of steel penetrated his uniform. He turned round, and having dropped his rifle, raised his hand. Hands. I could see that he was well and truly old enough to be my father. For a time, I held a sense of guilt after that incident, and I poked the bayonet into the ground several times. It had occurred to me that if I was ever captured, I would be giving a hard, given a hard time if there was blood on the bayonet, and I was obsessed with removing the slightest trace. Wow. And I'm, I'm assuming that you know, the feeling of guilt will also have to do with, with looking the enemy into the eyes, which, well, also in World War II was not a regular thing. Uh, luck- well, I'm saying luckily, you know, I'm feeling luckily the Germans survived. So that was a uh, long time afterwards. That was a good thing, I think. Wow. And maybe also nice Roland Jefferson. He later became the Normandy Veterans Association National Standard Bearer. And he took uh, quite a prominent part in the 1994 um, anniversary of D-Day in the Battle of Normandy. That's, That's where I know his name from, Ronald. As you, as you, I, I was thinking I know that name because I used to know a couple of standard bearers. That's where I know it from, 94. Yeah. Yeah, okay, good. Okay. Now, I'm saying limited casualties uh, for the Rifle Brigade, but of course also there are casualties. Now, I want to mention two, uh, Walter Medley. Um, he was from E Company, and he was killed uh, when a German prisoner of war, so after he'd been taken prisoner, uh, took a grenade out of his pocket and, and set it off, which killed uh, Walter Medley. Um, and another one was uh, Rifleman Harry Perry. He was uh, Batman to Lieutenant Sedgwick, so assisting him uh, more or less. I don't know if the system in America was the same, but that was how it went in the, in the British Army. Anyway, Harry Perry got uh, seriously wounded by a piece of shrapnel, but uh, Sedgwick, he only found out a few weeks later after he got wounded himself during Goodwood, or sorry, during um, Lookout, and he wrote a letter to, um, to Perry's parents uh, when lying in hospital. And sadly, uh, Sedgwick himself also got killed later on in Holland, uh, um, I believe in April. No, must have been earlier. In 1945, um, certainly. So, um, 
Uh, this is one of the this is a telegram written to the to the parents of uh, of Perry. So that uh, well must have been uh, yeah must have of course have been enormous enormous shock mm. to them. Right. Okay. Um, no, so after Goodwood, it was back across, uh, across the Orne uh, once again. Of course, the British army stayed on the uh, on the east side of the Orne, uh, getting reinforcements again. Also, in the third quote, you see getting fresh rations again, because up to then they'd been, been eating out of these compo crates and canned food and everything. So uh, that must also have been a pleasant surprise to get some fresh food. Uh, for a long time. And then by the end of the month, uh, they got orders again the day before the operation started to move to Como, some uh, 40 kilometers to the west of the point where the division was at the, at the time. So even moving from, from east to west in this, uh, how do you put it, congested area was, was an achievement on its own. Yeah which had to be done on the 29th and they had to go into battle the next day. So, yeah, uh, difficult to imagine how that must have been uh, as a preparation for battle. Um, Operation Blue Coat, it's, it's sometimes called the uh, British Breakout. Uh, this time- I, I wish, that's what I want to interrupt. I wish us historians could agree that we would all start calling the American Operation Cobra, Cobra Part 2, and Blue Coat, Cobra Part 1, because I think that's a much better way of explaining it. If if Americans and Canadians watching this, you know, think of Operation Cobra as thinking of this is the first chapter of Operation Cobra, because Blue Coat, I think, in terms of American uh, understanding of the Normandy campaign, falls through the cracks a bit. But that would be, be my suggestion, renaming it Cobra Part 1. <laughs> Yeah, the, the, the British Breakout, uh, it was a title of a book by, by Major Howe from the Monnashur Regiment, uh, one of the, the infantry regiments in the 11th Armoured Division. But anyway, they, they really broke through the German lines. Uh, they made use of, um, uh, of an opening between two German army, armies, which was uh, largely undefended. Um, so yes, after this, um, I think it was really done for, for the Germans in, uh, in Normandy. And of course, after this, the, the um, battle continued towards uh, Thales and towards the Seine at, at a much quicker pace. Um, and an advance of about uh, 30 kilometers. So uh, much more ground being gained than in the earlier operations. Then about the, the Eighth Rifle Brigade itself. Uh, they were fighting on the, on the right flank of Operation uh, Goodwood. Uh, at the beginning, um, uh, following on again after the 15th Scottish Division with the six guards armed, uh, the Churchill tanks, um, they led the advance from from Conan to to well somewhere beyond uh, Setvan, and then a little bit before Saint Martin de Bezas, um, the Eighth Rifle Brigade got orders to take the village. So um, they came in from the north. Uh, I think if you do one more click, uh, they come in in from the north at Saint Martin de, de Bezas. Uh, along this road, you see in the top photograph. Uh, in the bottom photograph, you see um, at the end of this photo, you see a, a house. In fact, the hotel. You, you can just probably just make out uh, the, the building at the end of the of the road. So well, that's the same building as the hotel shown in the lower photograph and the hotel is still there it's a bit a bit worse for wear and it's not an hotel any longer but it's really also a great place to visit and there's also a great museum by the way in saint martin de Desas. yeah very good yes um anyway uh you see the road leading into saint martin de Desas. you see the hotel uh, standing at this important crossroads and um, I've again got a fragment from uh, Don Gillett's tapes describing what happened here, what happened when taking the village. Uh, 
And also what happened to this specific um, Daimler Dingo um, armored car from the second household cavalry. Okay, I'll play that. 14 platoon went forward on foot towards the top of the hill overlooking the village and met opposition in the form of a tank tucked away on the road under a steep bank. Deciding the village was held, 14 platoon eventually withdrew, but not before Corporal Fulton, he was a rather charming Scotsman in fact, had considerably shaken the occupants of the tank with a well-aimed grenade, causing it to disappear back in the direction of the village. 15 platoon moved forward in support, and the two platoons remained for the rest of the night on the reverse slope of the hill. This was not a party that we in the carriers could have very much to do with. Any move we made would have been much too noisy, so we had to sit back about a quarter of a mile behind that crossroad, in a field, while our unfortunate brethren in the motor platoons got on with the job. So that evening we had a fairly passive role, but knowing that the following morning it was likely that the company would have to mount a full-scale attack on the village, and we'd have to get across that road somehow. The trouble was that every time anybody tried to get anywhere near that crossroads corner, the gun or tank or whatever it was that was giving us so much trouble and probably the one that the gallows sergeant had passed had a pot shot at them and casualties were suffered. But the following morning something quite extraordinary happened. It was about eight o'clock and we began to hear a roar of motor engines on the road behind us. We didn't think it was the enemy, we hoped it wasn't, but it certainly wasn't tech. Uh, it was something else, and they were coming very, very fast. And we were absolutely amazed by this, but not so amazed as eventually were the Germans, because it turned out to be a section of the household cavalry in armored cars. And they belted past us at a tremendous lick, heading straight for that fatal corner. One felt like running up and saying, well, don't go down there. There were Germans. They've got a gun. They're, 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 they'll blow it to pieces. But they went straight on, and so fast did they go that the leading vehicle went straight over that corner and down the other side, which is the thing that we had not dared to do. The second vehicle, and by this time the Germans had pulled themselves together, was hit by the anti-tank gun, or tank, or whatever it was, and burst into flames, but had the sense to pull himself off the road into the ditch. The third vehicle went right through and across the road before the Germans could reload, and he went down the other side of the road, down the other continuation of the road that we were on in pursuit of his leading vehicle. Well, now, this was performance of the most utter gallantry. I'd never seen anything like it uh, before, and I haven't seen anything since. It was sheer charge of the light brigade. So that morning, our uh, attack duly went in as planned, and one slightly black-humoured episode uh, took place in this, and that concerned Johnny Straker, Captain Straker. And he ordered a soldier to put on his steel helmet during the battle. And unfortunately, uh, the soldier turned out to be a German soldier who probably shot him and wounded him. It was not too serious a wound, thank heavens, but uh, it was not without its slightly amusing side. Or shall we say, worse things were happening. At any rate, I know the villagers of uh, saint martin de Bezas remember the episode to this day, and the curator of the local 11th Armored Division Museum refers to it whenever you speak to him. Captain Philip May came up to take over the command of the attack, and with G Company's help, uh, we eventually managed to take the village, although I suppose it was the clearance by the first helipads coming in from the right flank with the support of some tanks that really settled the day. Great stuff. Yes, and Captain Stryker, in, in fact, he got wounded two more times, but he did uh, eventually survive the war. Yeah. 
Um, no, so then uh, Saint Martin de Bezas was taken. And from there, the, the advance continued through this uh, largely undefended country, especially through the Frère Levic, or Devic, not really sure. Levic, uh, yeah, Frère Levic. Ba basically, it was, was perfect uh, country for defense, uh, very narrow road, uh, surrounded by woods on all sides, lots of bands, but it was simply undefended. So um, over the next uh, one, well, in fact, two days, uh, in two days, Lebanese Bocage was, was reached uh, with a burning uh, German tank on, on the market square taken out by the 23rd Hussars. Or in fact, the track was only hit by the 23rd Hussars and the tank itself was blown up by its crew. Um, but the, the, well, the, the advance went, uh, went really well. Um, and if you go to, to the next slide, then from um, Le Bénil Bocage, I think it was another 10 kilometers or so toward uh, Brel, uh, and Le Bapelier, and uh, Chandelet. Chandelet being the, the furthest point of the advance during Operation Blue Coat for uh, the 8th Rifle Brigade. Um, and if we go to the next slide, we will zoom in a little bit on these uh, three villages. Uh, well, uh, Brel again and Le Bapayer, or the Le Bapayer Ridge. That was really, uh, well, again, a little bit like uh, Hill 112, although quite a lot more uh, more pronounced. Uh, and to the south, uh, Chandelet. And anyway, um, it had been decided that this hill, this Le Bapayer Ridge, really had to be held by the British Army. Uh, and that was, in this case, the 8th Rifle Brigade, the complete 8th Rifle Brigade, together with the tanks of the 23rd Hussars, who were this time with the 8th Rifle Brigade on top of this hill. So exposed on all sides. And also with German tanks on all sides, as we'll, we'll sh we will hear in a moment from Don Gillet, uh, at one point the hill was completely surrounded by German tanks. Yeah, so the three pictures on the, on the top one, you see uh, E-Company carriers, machine gun carriers uh, arriving at, at Prel uh, from the north. Uh, on the right, you see the same, uh, same piece of road. In the background, you can see the Le Bapaye Ridge, uh, where the 8th Rifle Brigade and the 23rd Hussars were. And the bottom picture, um, it's also a modern picture I took myself. Uh, you look back at, um, at Prel, uh, more or less from the position uh, which Don is also describing. And I think if you zoom in a little bit on the bottom picture, I would like to, to mention two things, uh, Paul, which are relevant to the, to the tape of Don. One is the, the church steeple, uh, which if you look at the top picture also has got a different shape uh, these days. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, also the two white uh, houses to the left of the church are interesting. That's um, a crossroads which Don also described in this. Uh, this is the final audio fragment I've used. But uh, well, Don gives a very good description of what, what life was like uh, on top of the hill for these uh, few days. Well, we'll play it. But the reception that we were given by the people of prayer was absolutely unbelievable. The diary reports that eggs and liqueur were pressed upon us. Well, I think that pressing eggs upon us is perhaps um, a rather too graphic a picture. It makes us look rather messy, but certainly we were drinking Calvados by the tumbler, and this was not a good thing. But, of course, by far the worst aspect of the whole thing was the fact that they had rung the bells, because as soon as they did that, the Germans knew that we were in the village, and they could prepare accordingly. Incidentally, I've been back to Pareto since on more than one occasion, and I have to report that it is exactly as it was on that day that we arrived. It hasn't changed a mite, except that somebody blew the top steeple of the church and that has been replaced with one of a different shape. Otherwise the place is exactly the same. 
So the next four or five days were to be among the bloodiest that we experienced all the way from the beaches to the Baltic. During that first night alone, it was not difficult for the enemy to hit one of our tanks because we were all in close leaguer and all our vehicles were really quite close together. So whatever they threw up at us at any time was bound to hit somebody. And on that very first night, we suffered some very severe casualties. However, the following morning, something extremely nasty happened. From our position, we could see down the hill that we'd come up uh, the day, previous day. We could see down the hill to the village of Prell, where the bells had rung, and they'd been so pleased to see us. And we could actually see, uh, with my prized binoculars, we could see that road junction that we had had to come down and um, to make our way up to Barberier and then across to Chendolet. But what happened was that some of our support vehicles, including an ambulance, came round that corner with every intention of coming up to supply us or to take away wounded. But they hadn't got more than a couple of hundred yards up the road when behind them came two huge German tanks round the corner by the church onto that road heading for us and we, of course, being about a kilometer away up the hill. The unfortunates in the supply vehicles didn't realize that they got these two tanks behind them until a shell came into the rear one. This was rather shattering, and it was terrible for us to watch because we couldn't do anything about it. There were casualties, of course, and those in the vehicles tried to get out, and we had to stand there looking on helplessly, uh, while we saw those who had escaped with their lives taken prisoner. We could do nothing. None of our tanks could do anything. It was too far away for them, hopelessly beyond their range. So all we could do is watch transfixed in horror while our friends were taken prisoner. But of course, that wasn't all. The fact that the German tanks were there at all meant that they had completely closed the ring round us, and even that road back was now blocked. And with it, our supply line, of course. But there were more horrors to come during that particular day. That was by no means the end. That was only the overture. It was about, I suppose, 8 o'clock in the morning, that episode. But for the rest of that day, we were subjected to HE attack and mortar attack and moaning minis. Everything came down on us, including, I may say, the American Air Force, who dive-bombed us. So it was really quite a party, one way and another. And by about five in the afternoon, the entire hill appeared as if it was ablaze. They had managed to catch tanks of ours and soft skin vehicles as well. So uh, there was never any need to look around for somewhere to boil a kettle because there were plenty of burning vehicles. He's so British, isn't he? That, that, I, 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 that's <laughs> people saying that, you know, there's, there's a real British understatement in the way he talks there. It's, uh, it's a, they are a gift, those tapes, and thank you for sharing them with us. It was a it was a real British uh, gentleman. He was, yeah. Um, so yes. Um, so then on on the fourth, after this description uh, given by Don, um, um, the the battalion was was relieved by the I believe the second uh, Herefordshire regiment, if I'm not not mistaken. I hope I'm not. I believe from the third third division, temporary attached to Eleventh Armoured. And the rifle brigade for, for five or six days moved on a little bit more um, uh, towards Prell in this uh, dip in a sort of defensive position. Where, as I understand, they, they really had to stay underground, uh, taking uh, casualties from, from um, uh, artillery, German artillery coming in and uh, shells and everything coming in. But if you, if you take a look at the, at the picture, it's from Sergeant Froon uh, from G Company. I really like this picture, although it's uh, of terrible quality. It's really, um, uh, how do you say, degraded. Yeah. Uh, 
Well, apparently this is taken on the 8th of August. So apparently there was some occasion of uh, uh, doing some nicer things in life. So this is, well, given the fact that it was taken on the 8th, this must really have been taken uh, at well. And I would still like to find the, the exact location where this was taken. Um, so yes, so the Operation Blue Coat continued for a few more days until the 10th, and it was, was really over. Um, it really also was, the, the, the Rathman, they really had to be told it was a victor, victory. Yeah, they felt it was pretty much like, like Hill 1 and 2 again and Goodwood again. So they really had to be told it was a victory. And um, yeah, they also noticed it in the following days because the advance went so much faster in the following days. Um, so then, well, if I've summed it up in, in one slide, uh, what happened between uh, Blue Coat and uh, arriving at, at Vernon at the Seine. So a few days um, taking part on, on the southern part of the Battle of the Falaise Pocket. And there they also took their first German uh, general as a prisoner, General Barinsky. Uh, and the funny thing is um, his headquarters, the building was uh, some French farmhouse, was pointed out by an old French lady to this uh, Lieutenant Michael Anderson of, of the 12th platoon. And at first the German general, he refused to surrender to uh, Michael Anderson. He was a 19 year old uh, platoon commander, uh, probably quite uh, dusty, very different from, from this photo. Uh, sadly, he got killed in Belgium uh, a few weeks later. But the German general, he simply refused to, to, uh, to surrender to this young chap. So then um, uh, the officer commanding G Company was called for Major Noel Bell. But he again um, must have arrived there very dusty in his battle dress uh, jacket, not, not much different from the, uh, yeah, from, from the ordinary rifleman. And well, in the end, the, the, the general did, did surrender, but he had great difficulties with um, the uniforms of the, uh, of the British army and of the British officers. And I think in the, in the end, uh, even Lieutenant Colonel Hunter arrived, but same story again. But anyway, he was taken away. He had to, he had to surrender and he must have ended up somewhere in a prisoner of war camp. Yeah. So yes, and then on, on the 28th, um, well, a week before that, there's a sort of a pause, a real good rest at um, near L'Aigle, at the uh, sur -Ile. And then at, at the 28th, uh, the day before that, uh, some Bailey bridges have been built at uh, Vernon, and the Seine is crossed. And well, for the 8th Rifle Brigade, and I think for the British Army, for the Allied Armies, the battle for Normandy, Normandy is uh, virtually over. But yeah, as we see here at the cost, the, the, these are some, I think some 60 or 70 photos I've got of um, some of these killed and wounded. So remind us what their, their strength was when they arrived in Normandy back in June. The, there were um, about 850. So um, yeah, 378 casualties. So that's, that's, that's a lot. That's one in 10 killed, three in 10 wounded. Yeah, and that's, yeah, for, for a unit, like it's fair to say that a lot of the people watching here, some of our regular viewers, I'm thinking of Andrew in the USA and people like that, this is probably the first time they've heard of the 8th Battalion Rifle Brigade, maybe the first time they've considered the 11th, British 11th Armour Division. You know, you're doing another unit that suffers that kind of losses. And um, yeah, it's, it's great to bring, it's sad, but great to bring these stories to light. And um, I know we're not at the end of the show yet, but thank you very much for sharing this stuff with us because it's it's all it's all good and important history that isn't isn't known by a wide enough circle of people. I don't think. Yeah, I think it's uh, sad, but it's it's a quite common figure, I think, for infantry um, uh, battalions yeah. and, and even yeah. much higher for some, of course. But uh, well, if you're involved in this battalion, it's 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 really really serious, of course. And of course, as we're going to point out, it's not over yet. The, the, the Normandy campaign is over. And, you know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not here to belittle or anything the, the, the US involvement, but, but by the late, uh, late part of 1944, the Americans have enough divisional strength in reserve to start replacing some of their veteran divisions now. They've got these new divisions coming on the beaches. 
if you're in a British or Canadian division at this point of the war, you're there till the end. There is no other, there are no other units now. There are no more aces left to play. There are no, you get replacements to join the units, but there are no new units coming now. That's it. We've we've committed everything we've got, and it's just a question now, waiting to the to the war is 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 over. But uh, that strength in depth was going or lack of strength in depth was going to mean that these guys are at it for the next few months. Well, that, that's true, and also we, when you see when the rifle brigade arrives in, in Germany, um, at the size of the of the companies, uh, uh, really starts to get less and less because they simply can't replace uh, the yeah. troops anymore. So it's it's uh, they're really at at the end, not only at the end of the war, but also at the end of um, how should I put it, uh, capabilities or capacity. Yeah, fighting fighting capability. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Now, I've put this one in uh, the previous one uh, because after the crossing the Seine, um, it's quite amazing, but it's of course all, also what led up to, to, to Market Garden. But only three days later, they're, they're liberating Amiens, and uh, only one week later, uh, they're liberating Antwerp. That's the city of Antwerp, um, not uh, Scheldt, uh, I'm afraid. Yeah, that's yeah, another that's story. That's another so, story which we've yeah, covered before. So, so yeah. it, take, it takes them only one week to do about 400 kilometers from, from Normandy to Antwerp. Whereas before that, it has taken them two and a half months to, to get from the beach to, uh, to the Seine. And, the, and this summarizes essentially what we've been saying on World War II TV for so long is that the Normandy campaign, people perceive it as a slow campaign. American historians say the British Canadians were slow near Caen, slow to capture Caen, slow to move. Well, that's not true anyway, because as we know, the Normandy campaign was projected to last 90 days. It took 77. So we came in 13 days under schedule. But also, as you just said, the next week we did 400 kilometers. So the next mm -hmm. yeah, the, the, the next campaign, we're, we're leaping countries. We're leaping across France into Belgium. And so if, if anyone has any doubts about how successful the Normandy campaign was, the German army, we had either beaten there or the few remaining units that got out in the Falaise pocket, they have to re re retreat hundreds of miles. So the Normandy campaign was was costly, but my God, that the, the, they do fantastically well, the British, Canadians, and American forces there to destroy basically the German army there. Yeah, I think attrition is a appropriate title for the for the week yeah. shows. Yeah, definitely. Uh, also, especially of the German army. So yes, that's, that's um, something completely different from Normandy. I put this one in. Uh, I've of course used some material from uh, from some museums and some collections, but especially I want to thank uh, all the well veterans or mainly uh, family from veterans who. who Contribute, contribute it to the material of use. And I also want to use this as a, as a call for uh, well, anyone who's listening in. Uh, if you've got more material, please uh, get in touch with, through the website or through Facebook. And uh, well, I would be really interested to, to not only to receive uh, material uh, digitally, uh, I'm meaning, but also to share it again uh, through the website yeah. uh, with other people. Well, that's one of the things we've got now on World War II TV. There is a bit of a community now. Brad Sanquire is watching this from On This Day in Canadian History. He's a prolific user of archives, and there's the Project 44 team in Canada that, that, that have archives. That it's a, The last year has been a revolution in terms of people getting to know each other. I hadn't heard of many people two years ago. I now consider friends. I'm now sharing information with sharing archives. So, yeah, for people watching this, if there's anything you feel you can add to this, get in touch with Ronald, and it'll be... Um, the information will be will be used very well. Um, it will. That's a great uh, photo, so by the way. That's the end. There, there are the uh, maybe nice to know. It's at uh, Schleswig, uh, where the um, uh, battalion ended in, in um, a little after VE day. And I think they were there until they were being disbanded in April 1946. But this is a, a section of uh, 12 platoon, if I'm right, a section of. That's a great factor. Or a, a section, sorry, a platoon of half tricks. Yeah. Well, it's we're, we're, we're coming to the end of the show, Ronald, and it's, I've, I've re really enjoyed it. And I, you know, I just want to say, if people want to go and particularly read of the, of the operations we covered, I think Epsom, Goodwood, Blue, Blue Coat is the one I think is least written about. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a good, the, the Charge of the Bull, the 11th Armored Division history is worth reading. 
Um, obviously, James Holland covers it in his Normandy book. Uh, Six Armies in Normandy covers it a bit by John Keegan. But Blue Coat, I think, to, for the, again, for the Americans watching this, think of it as Cobra Part One. It'll make, make it sound slightly more exciting and sexy then. Um, uh, but it is all part of the breakout. If I can mention it, I, I really like Ian Douglas's uh, books. Oh, Ian Douglas, yeah, On the three yeah. operations. He said he's passed away, but... Uh, yeah, that's a very good point. Ian Douglas's books are great. I, I knew Ian quite well, and he was a, a, a consummate historian, and his books have great aerial photos as you that, that show, take you to the battlefield. And again, I've always said it, when you get to Normandy, go and visit these inland places, the Odon Valley, San Martin de Bizas, the museum that Ronald mentioned. There's a great museum there. You can go and visit the bridge. The 11th Armour Division captured. You can see all these sites there. You can, as you said, just see the ground. Um, these winding roads. Uh, we've covered a lot of World War II TV, the, the changing countryside of Normandy, the open wheat fields for the Canadians in the first few days, the bocage the Americans faced, and the, that in that area kind of from Veer in the west across the Fleur, across towards Domfront, is a very different kind of. I think I'm, I'm probably going to drive through Saint Martin de Bézas tomorrow. We're going south for for a little little kind of uh, sojourn, little trip, and I'll probably end up mm. driving through it myself tomorrow. So it's it's fantastic country. I'm envying you, Paul. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I well, it's I, I live here, so it's easy for me. But anyway, well, in terms of what we were coming up, I'll just I'll just remind people got coming back, and I'll, I'll come up and I'll speak to you in a minute. So, yeah, I've got a break for the weekend, but Monday we're starting Medics Week. I've uh, got some absolutely amazing shows coming up for you there, including me. I'm I'm the historian on my own show, talking about my book. Uh, Angels of Mercy. The last we got Reg Jans, the famous guide in Baston, talk about aid stations, the 101st Airborne used in Baston. We got a great show. Uh, Dr. Thomas Helling is talking about American surgical procedures in World War II. Ted Barris, the Canadian, is returning to talk about rush to danger. His book on medics. It's all coming up next week, folks. I'm really looking forward to that. It'll be, it'll be a really good week. But right now, it means me to say thank you very much to Ronald for joining us. Uh, people have been asking about whether or not. There is a book. The description is in the uh, the YouTube. The, the, the link sorry, is in the description below. And also the link to Ronald's website. I added, I hadn't added it before. I added it before the show went live early. It's there. You can get in touch with Ronald there. You can find out more about his work, the photos, the archives there. And, um, yeah, a, a good comment there from Martin. I, I would love to do a show about the 53rd Welsh. That would be Jonathan Ware's department. When I get John Ware on, we'll do something about the 53rd Welsh. That'd be really good. The museum in Saint Martin de Bezas is the Operation Blue Coat. Blue, it's called the Percé de Bocage. Percé de la Bocage, which is the piercing of the Bocage. It's all the Blue Coat Museum. It's changed that the curators changed a couple of times the last couple of years, but it's it wasn't open while I was there in March. But it's open again for the, so I think it's open weekends and stuff. But you can find. A, I'll try and add the. Uh, uh, the link to the museum. I'll add that to the description after the show finishes. So there we go. So brilliant. Well, thank you very much. I will let you get on. And uh, for those watching, enjoy your weekend. As usual, share what we're doing on social media. Check us out on Patreon. Check Ronald's website. Check out the book. Buy the book. And uh, thank you for watching us. It's been really great. So enjoy your evening, everybody. This is Paul Woodhatch from World War II TV saying uh, have a good weekend. Bye-bye.